This lecture will be discussing part one of The Stranger by Albert Camus. Uh, in most copies of this book, uh, that brings it up to about the 60 page mark or so, and this first part is broken into multiple chapters. As I mentioned in the introduction, uh, this book, many of the things that happen in the first part perhaps seem a little uh, mundane when you're encountering them initially, but then they all sort of come back with a vengeance uh, in the second half once we get to the climactic end of the first part. So in this lecture, we'll be moving through it uh, slowly but surely, one chapter at a time, uh, focusing mostly on asking key questions and introducing themes uh, rather than giving direct interpretations. So in chapter one, this is the great initial setup with that incredibly famous uh, first sentence, uh, maman, which is a French term uh, of endearment for a mother. Uh, it's sort of a, a little bit shy of mommy. It's kind of like mama uh, died today. So that whole entire issue there introduces a situation in which uh, Mirasol, our disengaged lead character, is at his mother's funeral, but he doesn't really seem too terribly affected by it, uh, complaining more about being tired in the weather than anything else. So. Some of the key questions introduced by this first chapter are these. Was it wrong of him to put his mother in a home in the first place? Was that the right thing to do? Uh, people seem to be uh, concerned with that, and it's a, a major sort of issue in our era today. So that's one big question to consider. Another is, what do you think of his response to his mother's death? Uh, is his stoical, disengaged attitude okay? Is it acceptable to act this way? Or is the only way for him really to have an acceptable response to, you know, be crying and throwing himself on the ground or anything like that? Um, another big question, obviously, is does he love his mother? Uh, that's just something uh, to think about because what type of person doesn't love their mother uh, is one of the sort of big questions. Um, so one thing that I think is sort of interesting is the scene in which all of uh, his mother's friends come into the room and he sees their faces incredibly clearly. In fact, it says, I saw them more clearly than I had ever seen anyone and not one detail of their faces or their clothes escaped me. Um, so this is sort of an interesting little detail. And then he, uh, right after that, says, for a second, I had the ridiculous feeling that they were there to judge me. Um, so it gets into this whole entire idea of what you notice and what you notice don't notice, and uh, are you being judged? There's also the issue in chapter one of Thomas Perez, who is the late in life uh, boyfriend of sorts of uh, Mirsal's deceased mother. Uh, and there's the big question of should Mirsal have helped him when he was struggling because uh, Perez is here crying and fainting and struggling uh, to keep up and Mersal, the son, doesn't seem to be terribly engaged. So those are some of the things brought up by chapter one. Uh, chapter two is sort of an interesting one uh, where it introduces the character Marie and the character C Celeste and also uh, is sort of notable for the fact that in that second chapter Nothing really happens. Uh, he spends a lot of the time just sort of sitting there staring out the window. And it makes you ask the question of Camus, uh, why bother depicting uh, this lazy day? Okay, but one thing to remember is that everything in this book is on purpose. And it raises this sort of grander sort of existential question of must we act to fulfill a day? Or is there anything wrong with inaction? Uh, is the act of not trying to advance your life and not actually doing anything, is that necessarily a waste of time? So that's an issue brought up uh, by the second chapter. In the third chapter, we are introduced to the uh, somewhat comic effect character in some ways of Salamano, uh, who 
is kind of terrible because he uh, abuses his dog, thus asking you again to make sort of a, a moral judgment. You know, in the previous chapter, it was uh, action versus inaction. In this chapter, you have to make the moral judgment of, is Salamano a bad person because he's mean to his dog? But then there's also sort of the issue of uh, he and his dog are all each other have, uh, so they rely on each other. We're also introduced to Raymond, who's sort of a lightning rod in the story, and we're sort of forced to consider, you know, what are we to think of this Raymond guy? In many ways, in our, you know, typical conception of the way to behave, he's kind of a slime ball. Uh, he's potentially even uh, a pimp, actually. Uh, in either way, uh, he's somebody who's sort of a part of the criminal underbelly. Uh, so it makes you wonder, you know, why is Mersal friends with this guy? Um, is Mersal bad just by having him uh, as an acquaintance? And it brings up the issue of can people have bad friends and not be bad themselves? Uh, if you're really going to be a good person, can you associate and tolerate somebody who's going to be a bad person? So Raymond is sort of a foil in some ways. A foil, uh, if you recall, is somebody who is sort of oppositional to a character. So he's a foil because uh, Mersal is profoundly honest, whereas Raymond is a liar. Uh, Mersal is somebody who embraces inaction and emotionlessness, whereas Raymond is somebody who is very much all about action and he's very emotional. So you can sort of see that opposition being brought up. And this chapter also really starts to raise the question of, does Mersal in fact have no true moral compass? Uh, and that's something to consider going forward. Chapter four uh, really starts to build up the sense of romance with Marie, but he does sort of, but Mersal does the crazy act of actually saying that he doesn't love her uh, when she posits the question to him. Uh, many people in relationships would consider this to be suicide, but Mersal just sort of does it without even thinking. Because again, one of the big themes here is his honesty. You know, he's just always tells the truth, even if it gets him in trouble. He also, in this chapter, agrees to be Raymond's witness uh, in the crime. And then we get it closing with uh, Salamano's dog missing and Salamano's problem with that. So it asks, uh, raises the question of whether Salamano is, in a sense, sort of in love with his dog and whether we should pity Salamano even though previously he had been mean to the dog. It's sort of a classic case of somebody being uh, codependent, uh, somebody being potentially abusive, but then upon the departure of the abused, uh, do you feel bad for them for the situation that they in fact have kind of gotten themselves into. Chapter five. Uh, this is an interesting one in which Mursal is actually offered a promotion at work, uh, but he doesn't really care. Uh, so when he says that it's meaningless, uh, this whole entire idea of whether you should go for a promotion or not, is he right? You know, is he correct uh, making these declarations about meaninglessness and is it true that our pursuits of trying to, you know, improve our lives and get promotions and, you know, move up and make more money, is all of this stuff that we try to do really kind of ridiculous? And in some ways, uh, Mersal is right. Um, this also shows that he, in many ways, uh, is a super agreeable character. He just sort of goes with the flow. Whatever life presents to him, he just sort of, you know, goes along with it. And when they bring up, uh, when he's talking to Marie, and Marie brings up that issue of marriage, uh, he's just like, sure, whatever. And when it's called a serious issue, he just disagrees. He's like, this isn't uh, a serious issue at all. Um, this chapter also introduces another foil, who is the, the robot woman. Uh, the woman who's very orderly and shows purpose in all of her actions. This is another foil for Mursal because he doesn't seem to really care much about structure or order or purpose in his actions. He just sort of goes with whatever happens. In chapter 6, this is where uh, things really start to get a little bit more complicated. 
um, where we get instances of him complaining of a headache and complaining of uh, the sun being too bright and hot for him. Uh, and then we get this sort of situation in which we're sort of have to deal with the question of what we as readers and as people who judge other people are to think of Marie. Um, he, uh, you know, Mersal seems to want to be with her, but he doesn't really love her. And is Marie, is she uh, a sucker? You know, is she an idiot for wanting to be with this person? So it sort of brings up that kind of issue. Um, then we do get ourselves into this complicated situation uh, with the Arabs, uh, the people who are uh, after Raymond. And this is where the true movement of the plot starts to, you know, catch fire a little bit. So they encounter the Arabs, uh, they see the knife, all of this sort of stuff, and then uh, ultimately you are put into a position where uh, Mersal just sort of, you know, gets himself into this uh, terrible mess that perhaps is going to end up ultimately uh, potentially being the end of him. So it raises all of these complicated issues. When Mersal does go back and he finds the Arab and he shoots him, you have to ask, why on earth did he do this? Uh, one intelligent person uh, was posed the question of, why did Mersal shoot the Arab? And that person responded, why not? And that sort of brings up that greater sort of existential issue of like purpose and reason. Um, should he have shot? Should he have not shot? Um, you know, to stay or go? Uh, does it all just, in a sense, amount to the same sort of thing uh, in the end? Um, why did he go back in the first place? Why is the sun affecting him so much? Is he drunk? Is that his problem? Is that why he does this? Did he decide when he started walking away from the house by himself in the first place that he was going to kill? After all, he had the gun with him. Was this a premeditated act? You know, did he think his way through? The sun is problematic. It's something that bothered him on the day that his mother died, and here it comes back again. So he shoots. Why does he shoot? You know, was this his fate? Was it a free will thing? Uh, the existential issues of, is our judgment wrong? Do we make our own morality? Or are we subject to the morality of the greater culture around us? And then, of course, the issue of, he doesn't shoot him just once. He shoots him once, he pauses, and then he continues to shoot. Uh, so why does he do this? Is there anything in his character in the pages that came before that would lead you to believe that he really is uh, a premeditated, cold-blooded killer? Or was this just a freak event? Did he lose control of himself? Um, all of these issues are brought up and it gets him into this sort of senseless murder and this crazy situation that he's in now where in fact he has killed somebody and that closes down part one and puts us in place for the grand setup that's going to be whatever happens in part two.